The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Alrighty, so hello and welcome everyone to today's session. On behalf of the Special and Vulnerable Populations Task Force, we'd like to welcome everyone to our fourth and last webinar of the National Learning Series focused on comorbidities associated with diabetes. Our webinar today will discuss diabetes continuum of care using the CHW and Enabling Services Workforce to address social determinants of health from diabetes. So I'm here today as one of your moderators, Albert Eisen from the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or also known as APSHO. And I'm also joined by my colleagues, Joe Lee and Christine Alarcon, as well as Jillian Hopewell from the Migrant Clinicians Network. And we'll be serving as your moderators and organizers for today. So this learning series was created to address our diabetes epidemic, which is affecting approximately 30 million people across the US. To combat and continue the national conversation around diabetes, this Special and Vulnerable Populations Task Force created the series to increase knowledge of effective strategies to prevent, treat, and manage diabetes among health center program patients. So we have 14 National Cooperative Agreements, or NCA organizations, funded by HRSA, and we have partnered together to create this meaningful content and provide access to expert guest speakers for you, our audience, today. Uh, I would like to quickly highlight our NCA partners who have helped today's webinar, and those are us at APSHO, the Migrant Clinicians Network, MHP Salud, and the National LGBT Health Education Center, also known as the Fenway Institute. So we're going to quickly just have each NCA introduce themselves. Um, and first is us at APSHO. Uh, we are, again, a national cooperative agreement funded by HRSA to really focus on this aggregated race of ethnicity data collection, social determinants of health data collection, culturally and linguistically appropriate services, and also enabling services data collection, which we'll actually dive into later in our presentation. And you can visit our website at www.apsha.org for more information. And I'll have my colleague Jillian introduce MCN. Hi, everybody. This is Jillian Hopewell. So glad to see all of you here today. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with MCN, uh, we are also a national cooperative agreement. We uh, provide training, technical assistance, and a number of services to health centers and other health serving entities um, across the country. We're focusing on clinical issues and look at access to health care, quality improvement, um, diabetes and other chronic diseases, as well as a number of infectious diseases. We do a lot of work um, in continuity of care, as well as occupational environmental health. And our population of focus is really looking at the mobile poor, so migrants who are moving for the purposes of work, whether that be agricultural work or construction or fisheries or a whole variety of other um, potential occupations. So very happy to have all of you here today. Thank you, Jillian. All right, and next up we have MHP Salud. So can I have Anane? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Anane Hernandez. Um, I am with MHP Salud. Uh, MHP Salud is also part of the National Cooperative Agreement. We are a national nonprofit with over 35 years experience implementing community health worker programs in underserved Latino communities. Um, we take the information that we learn from our direct service programs, and then we use them to provide training, um, technical assistance, and consultation um, to organizations that currently have a community health worker program and are looking to strengthen it or organizations that 
want to start a new community health worker program. So thank you guys for joining and uh, I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Anna Nick. And last but not least, we have the Fenway Institute. Do we have Kay or Dr. Kriglin on? Not sure if they jumped on yet, but yeah, this is one of the other 20 NCAs um, focused on the LGBT community. And again, their list of key areas and focus areas are here. Um, and Dr. Kariglian will be speaking on some of their SOGI data collection efforts and enabling services efforts at the Fenway Institute. So look forward to that um, towards the latter half of our presentation. All righty. So, um, just want to again wrap up the framework here. So just want to acknowledge that we have HRSA on the call today and their support to really push our task force efforts and decreasing the percentage of health center program patients with a hemoglobin A1C greater than nine. And we're excited to develop a clinical change package for diabetes care, which should be published sometime later this year. And so this is um, kind of a collective effort moving forward um, beyond 2019. So look forward to more of the series in the future. And our national learning series will also be utilizing the diabetes continuum of care framework. So you'll notice that all of our webinar series this year has the diabetes continuum of care. And today's webinar will be focused on the third one, facilitating behavior change in patients, which is one of the main strategies for diabetes prevention and management. And again, we're thankful for HRSA for providing this framework for us. And today's agenda will include a 90 minute presentation and Q&A that's immediately following. And we have three objectives here. So one is to explore strategies around integrating community health workers into the patient provider relationship to provide an improved diabetes outcomes. Second, to incorporate interdisciplinary team-based care concepts that address patients' health and social needs with diabetes. And lastly, third, to understand the value of enabling services and standardized ES data collection to address social risk factors of patients with diabetes. And I'm happy and excited to introduce our lineup today of many guest speakers from different health center entities. Um, we have Diana Lady, lead health promoter of Kansas Statewide Farm Worker Health Program. And then next we have Shara Karkamo and Monica Geldris. Um, Shara is a care coordinator and community health worker from the Western Wink Family Health Centers. And then Monica is also from the same organization and serves as the Chief Gaver Health Officer. And then we'll close out the last section with Dr. Andrea Karakostas, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Hope Clinic in Houston, Texas. And then Dr. Kariglian from the Fenway Institute again, he'll um, be talking about um, the SOGI data as we just previously mentioned. And then again, honored to really be joined here by Tracy Branch, who is the Commander and US Public Health Services Senior Advisor for HRSA. Um, she has been very supportive of the National Learning Series and the Diabetes Task Force, and we are honored to have her um, towards the end um, and kind of pull everyone on what it is their current challenges and needs are around preventing and treating diabetes. So thank you to Tracy Branch. And before we kick off the presentations, of course, we'd like to go so over some housekeeping. Um, here we have a screenshot of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts, the viewer window on your left and the control panel on your right. The viewer window allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen, and the control panel allows you to participate in the webinar. So just going through that. And in terms of your questions and comments, uh, please note that all you attendees are in listen only mode and will be muted during the webinar. You still may submit questions during the presentation by typing them into the questions field of your control panel on the right. Uh, please direct your questions to a specific speaker as much as possible and we'll make sure that we field those accordingly. Um, we will also be reviewing questions as they come in and we'll address them during the Q&A portion in the end. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, so please sit back and relax. Um, all attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording and presentation after the webinar. And lastly, you can interact with us at Twitter using the at AppShow tweets and also use the hashtag Diabetes National Learning Series. 
And then one more logistical note for y'all interested in the CME, CNE accreditations, um, we'd like to make sure that you complete the post webinar survey. If you'd like to receive the CME and CNE units of certificate of, and of attendance, um, you will have the option of indicating whether you'd like to have an electronic or hard copy or both. So for any questions around the um, accreditation, please contact Martha at MCN. Now I'd like to transition over to our first speaker, Diana Lady, who again is the lead health promoter of the Kansas Statewide Farm Worker Health Program. Um, and before we go into Monica, we're going to have Esli from MHP Salute introduce her. Good afternoon, Albert. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, can hear you fine. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for all of those who were um, uh, for this invitation, and it's an honor for me to be here. I am a community health worker. I, I work with clients who have uh, diabetes and and other chronic disease. I've been working more than um, maybe like six years as a community health worker, and and today I would like to speak about integrating community health workers into the patient provider team. And this will be, um, we will talk about a little bit of that, how uh, effective it is to have a community health worker as far as um, managing diabetes. And before I, I start, I would like to give just a little bit of, of the background of what is a community health worker and uh, also their roles. So the community health worker, uh, according to the American uh, Public Association, it said that it is um, a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member and that has an, an unusual close understanding of the community to, that we serve. Also talks about how the community health worker is like uh, a bridge, an intermediate, like it's, it's a person who, an individual who offers social services to the community and facilitate this uh, access to improve the quality and the cultural competence in order to deliver services. Also, the community health worker or CHW is an individual who builds who builds the individual, but also is building the community. And it's increasing that knowledge and how, how the way that, that the person increases the knowledge is such like doing outreach or education, or maybe like informal counseling, social support, or advocacy. Also the CDC um, have placed many articles and, and the CDC has, um, has um, a lot of uh, literature that talks about how the role of the community health worker required to fulfill those specific roles in order to evolve. Because what happened is that uh, the CHW is, is evolving to the in response to the chain in the healthcare delivery or out models, but also the public health strategies. And we're going to talk about a little bit later. And also, it has been proving that it can reduce the cost as far as chronic disease. Okay. So when we talked about CHW, since we we serve in such in such many capacities, it is important for uh, for the models that we use to define the scope of practice and the roles and the competence because we are uh, we are like like uh, working on education, peer counseling, advocacy, system navigation, and health coaching. And sometimes, if we don't define this scope of practice, it can overlap with other professions. And so, we want to be careful of that because we don't want to we don't want to cross that line. We want to have like a well defined. So, I think that that is important. And so, and when we talked about reducing costs, it has been proven that community health workers will definitely um, help to reduce costs because we offer 
uh, client education offers support that requires to manage chronic disease. And we also contribute to free the, the doctors and nurses and clinicians on their time. Is why provider instructions. What we do is that we we are like the, the culture broker because we speak the same language. We want to connect. We want to be culturally appropriate. We want to uh, offer those social service social service resources. And so as we are, as we are that bridge that goes to the culture and the community and the services. So what we do is that we we want to adopt that patient perspective. And when we do that, then we adapt to that patient needs. And again, so what happened is that we're improving that because we want to reduce these individuals to come to the ER. We want to make sure that the person understands the instructions from the doctor. We want to make sure that they know what kind of resources they have. We want to make sure that that especially with chronic condition, that they know how to navigate. And that is very important. And as, as a CHW, I help that person to walk into that. And so for that reason, um, we wanna talk later about uh, some cases that show that there's actually um, a reduced cost on that. So it is important uh, when we talked about integrating community um, health workers or CSWs, and I didn't mention that we have we have many names, um, uh, not just CSWs, um, like outreach worker or maybe promotoras or hub promoter or navigator or peer supporter or peer leader. There's you know there's many names depending on the of the organization. I wanted just to, to mention that. But it is important to mention that as we integrated into the health um, care team delivery, especially in Crohn's disease, so typically there is um, a model that includes the provider, you know, doctor, practitioner, physician, or, or maybe the medical assistant, and this team has a uh, deliver a specific model, maybe for that specific clinic. And so the CHW uh, is kind of like in, in between because she can provide not only the resources for that particular clinic, but she can know the resources in the community. She knows where the, the safety net clinics are a qualified health center and the community-based organizations that can maybe she she or he can re, uh, reach out to help um, these to help clients. So the CHW has a strong connection with the community and knows the community very well. Has the potential to advocate based on the issues that these. The, the individual with the chronic disease might struggle, knows the resources, and is, uh, has a reliable life experience. It's an active listener, knowing that there is a potential error, or maybe also there is a potential not understanding of the, the instructions. And so this person is able to know exactly uh, how to direct the client into um, helping them. Uh, gives like a flexible support to the client. It's very understandable. It's a trusted member of the community and offer the education, prevention, and intervention. And it kind of have that balance, uh, like I was talking before about the, the social and the culture, because many times it speak the same language. And receiving instructions in your own language makes a huge difference. And so having that person who is um, a, a culture broker, but also an interpreter, and also knowing those clues uh, about when when the client is not understanding or maybe is frustrated, uh, or you know helping on that uh, absolutely help with the outcome uh, of, of especially with current issues.
Um, yeah, Dan, I think you just clicked one more. I think you have transitions in this slide. Keep okay. clicking to the right. Mm -hmm. I can help here. Uh, there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. So, when it comes to the uh, to the American uh, Diabetes Association, they have models for the community health worker, and what they said is that they have different models where they. Um, I, I just gonna add them in here. Yeah, you can you can add them because yes, on the five. Yeah. So uh, what happened is that they have um, they study how community health workers can work with individuals who have diabetes, and they put us in level number one. So we are not a we're not a care, a, a professional who has our credentials or we don't have a, a person like number five who has an advanced level on diabetes education, but they recognize that we can talk, we can teach about the lifestyle, we can talk to them about how they can take care of themselves. And what they, what they said is that for us, uh, they found evidence that we can identify the materials that can be appropriate for the age for the level of the culture, the background, and physical and the cognitive abilities. They talked about how we can assist them, uh, support with the community resources that is important for that, for that client who has diabetes. They talked about the importance of us doing the self-managing, helping them with those barriers, and helping them with the plan, and just kind of, mitigate that the the anguish in in the the time and and so they 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 were able to to um recognize how we can help and also they uh they said that we can teach and reinforce and validate the self management management skills using um the principles for teaching because we want to we want to be goal oriented. We don't want to just uh, like do everything for for our clients. What we want to do is, is to help with that self management. What is it that is uh, not allowing you to you know take your medicine, or they have issues with the pharmacy, or why you're not coming to your to your uh, appointments? Maybe it's transportation, maybe is um, anything. So a number of things. So what we want to do is um, recognize, recognize those barriers, and for us, we must be equipped according to what it has, according to what we are and in our organization, um, to to give that information to them, and also to uh, again our scope of practice within the organization, so that way we're not overlapping and that the staff organization not exactly what we're doing. So that is very, very key. And so again, the Diabetes Association talks about how we're not necessarily like, I have a, a, a high level of, or with a professional or anything like that, but, but they give us the tool to help them how to eat better and how to um, be better with their lifestyle and just, giving them direction and offering education. And so, so that's important. Next. Oh, you have control, Diana. So go ahead right there. Okay. Perfect. Got it. Perfect. So again, um, I just want to kind of summarize a little bit. So it is important that when we integrate PHWs on their uh, a team, it is important that we understand the population we serve. You know, where they at, are they coming, why they're not coming. Uh, it, it is important that also I, I serve that population, that, that, that I embedded, that, that I'm from that population. It'd it be the best if it's possible, so that way I can, I come from there, I, I go to you know, I do home visits, so I understand exactly what I'm talking about. It's not like I'm 
from outside. It will be the best if it's that. Um, educate the whole team, uh, not just the person in the front desk, but the doctor, the nurse, the 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 people who work in pharmacy, the people who work in radiology, everybody. Educate everyone to know what is my, my scope of practice. This is where I like I start and I finish here. But also like to know that this is how I can help. This is how can I advance uh, you know my my client and and recognize the struggles of uh, of our client who have a chronic disease and obviously something that it can it can be coordinated that it can can flow so that workflow as we define and we embed that that workflow it helps to improve the outcome of the the, the population we serve and as we integrate this this team it's important to have uh, the the CHW uh, connected or coordinated with yeah, it'd be like a case manager, maybe a navigator, coordinator for all the clinics and the uh, departments. So that way um, it will flow better. Uh, it is important to place the referrals uh, in the protocols in your clinic. So that way it'd be easy. And of course, uh, close communication with the partners reassuring our performance. So let's talk just a little bit of the of the findings. As we know, um, diabetes is uh, an epidemic, and what we want is to reduce that disparity. And so I just want to say really briefly about um, about this um, the CDC. Um, talked about how in a participation of the community health representative diabetes and in, uh, American Indian and Alaska commun communities. And they were talking about how the, the CHWs are called uh, community health representatives. And I think it's, it's fascinating how they said that, uh, they talked about how they are equipped to be the, the culture broker and that they have a relationship that is shaped by the culture and the history. They talked about how they um, help when, when diabetes become more and more common as a serious illness. So how it was introduced into the team, especially uh, in this area. And they said how it, this is, is a front-line caregiver. They talked about how it is important because the, the, the representative help in the gap, in the gap between the people and their resources. And, the, and it goes beyond just the medical, it's kind of like a member, like a family member. And so when, when that person shows to the rescue, it just do way and beyond. And so, and I, I believe that is, I mean, it's, it's like that for, for all, all, all other cases. But again, uh, these, uh, this article was talking about that it, it resolved and improved health behaviors and improved the health status with fewer, fewer uh, hospitalization and compared with the usual care. So again, many other studies show that uh, when you introduce a, a CHW, improves the glycemic control and, uh, and, and if you were, it reduced the, the person to be coming to the emergency room. But also, uh, when a community health worker uh, speak in their own language, you can get that education in your own language. It just, it just gives another level of understanding. And, and this helps because they can come back, you know, as they are nicely and we give them with, you know, we put, we put a smile and, and we, we just give that with so much passion, then um, they want to come back, they want more. And, you know, and we, we have to do it in a very dynamic way. So that way, you know, that way they can come back. So, oh, I, and, um, and last, um, just to just to um, just to kind of closing, it is important that for for us, it is important to have uh, a well 
uh, documented that you know as the as the as the organization provides a, a good you know database to managing the notes to have that weekly supervision of the documents and, and in cases it could be complicated and how we can better um, help that our clients to to have that emotional support not just for the for for our clients but also for the CHW because we have to we endure a lot of things also and so it is important just to have those healing conversations also um, to have that access that continued education you know like um, to the um, echoes and workshops and and integrating this into the and the ongoing process. Also, to see what a state education uh, export or a state coalition plans, anything of this that can, we can participate, that will make a difference. Because again, this is and this is evolving, and we need to learn. And things are changing, and and the strategy are changing every day. So that is very important for us to continue. So thank you so much. That's that's all I have. Thank you so much, Diana, and really appreciate you sharing the perspective of and the importance of the CHW workforce and model. And we're actually going to segue into um, another set of speakers who have um, a CHW on their team. So I'm now uh, privileged to introduce Shara Karkamo, care coordinator and community health worker at the Western Wayne Family Health Centers, along with Monica Geldress, Chief Behavioral Health Officer at the Western Wayne Family Health Centers. And we'll actually have um, Asli uh, um, from MHP Salud do a quick uh, preface. Oh, Hello, Asli, everyone. Yes. Can you hear Great. me? Yes. Yes, here you're fine. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Joe and Diana. Um, well, today, this uh, next um, section goes perfectly with Diana's presentation, where we talk about a lot about CHW clinical integration. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to introduce the CHW clinical integration into, into care team's principles and, out, and highlight some strategies. And these are mainly for health centers, um, staff, leadership and the whole team in general. And these are mainly the effective integration of CHWs and also what has geared success in other health centers throughout the nation. And as you can see, we have multiple principles and I don't have much time to go over each of them, but I want to highlight some and that you may um, feel that you're already doing them, but those are important for your health center if you're a CHW to evaluate, right? What has been your integration in the care team? So um, the first one is promoting respect for the CHW profession. And um, also that goes ahead with educating all team members of what CHWs, who they are, what they do, and the potential impact that they have, not only um, in their workflow or in their systems, but also in the patient's, patient's health. Um, also incorporating CHW core competencies to the whole program. So whether it's a diabetes program, which is a smoking cessation program, and trying to put their essence in at the designing the planning, the implementation, or even the evaluation phases. And this goes along with providing opportunities for CHWs to share their knowledge and experience. We all, I believe, and most of us have had some kind of experience working with CHWs, and we know their value and their unique expertise they bring. So it's important to be able to take them into account, especially if they're gonna be involved and they're gonna be an important tool within those um, initiatives and also uh, provide CHWs the opportunity to contribute and participate in all data collection, whether it's electronic health record data or data in general. And um, these principles are part of two different resources that MHP Salud has been working in the past two years. And um, these are part, I'm gonna move to the next slide. Perfect. And these are part, this go along with some strategies. And these resources were done by performing interviews to different health centers throughout the nation. And what we discovered is that these principles together with the following strategies have proven to gear success. They have been, they have proven to gear, um, to have a successful CHW group that is pro, uh, 
this producing results. So some of the strategies are CHW and electronic health record data entry, CHWs participating in care teams and daily huddles, CHWs utilizing telehealth, and the impact of using CHW collected data in clinical decision making. And um, because I don't want to take more of your time, and if you're a little bit um, interested in finding more information about it, if this is something new in your health center or something that you would like to strengthen your um, your health clinical, CHW clinical integration, you already have them, but you're looking for opportunities or different strategies to maybe move them to another department or integrate them into another division, we do have two resources. One of them is available as of now. Um, there's a link there. If you click to the link, take us to our web page, um, and you can just create an account, download it. And these, um, these resource will give you an introduction to the CHW, and it's basically what the title is, making the case of the value of a CHW in a health center. It talks about their role, their impact, and um, we're also working on um, the, the other toolkit, which is Community Health Worker Clinical Integration Toolkit that should be available by June. And this one goes through all these four strategies and they're backed up by a case study. And knowing that, I want to do a smooth transition because I want to introduce one of the clinics that has worked pretty close with MHP Salud and who is an example of um, and an excellent representation of the success of integrating CHW into clinical care teams. So Western Wayne, the floor is yours. And Monica, can you speak up or Shara? Let me just double check that they're not on mute. All right, Shara. Oh, there you go, Shara. You're on now. Hi. Yes, hi. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, there you are, yep. Monica. Okay, I apologize. Um, I'm Monica Heldris, and we are from Western Wayne Family Health Center. We're an organization uh, where we have, we see approximately 15,000 patients, and we have a staff of over 120 individuals across all three clinics. And I, I tell you that to give you a sense of the size of the, the organization has a lot of implications for how we've been able to integrate um, do how we've been able to do integrated care and um excuse me and the challenges that we've faced uh albert i'm sorry have, have i lost the screen uh nope you should have the the mouse but i can help advance the slides if please please do okay i there we go um these are all the different services that we provide, and as you can see, the care coordination is, is considered one of the services amongst all of these others, OBGYN, pediatrics, and so forth. The, <clears throat> we've had uh, CHWs now with us since 2012, approximately, and we've gone through great evolution uh, in terms of their role, their place in the organization, and how they deliver services and how we've fully integrated them into our care teams, particularly with the, some of the tougher patients that we have who have a higher level of care. So when I say we've evolved, I'm saying that we've evolved in terms of our philosophy and as well as administrative logistics. Um, so for those of you who are interested in, in understanding how we've done this, I, I'm gonna break it down to some very basic um, uh, concepts because I think oftentimes we, we speak in general terms or uh, things that don't give you exact information that you can take back and use. That's what we're going to try to do today. Um, so as far as the, the evolution of CHWs, back in 2012, these folks were hired through different grants um, as well as supported by the clinic uh, itself and they provided a range of classes. It was really very, very early start. We did not have um, more than one or two CHWs at a given time. They were supposed to be able to be available for all uh, three sites um, or two sites back then and any of all and any and all of the practices. 
And at the time, you know, that's a starting point. They really were outreach workers. They were community presenters. Um, that was the nature of their work. Moving forward, especially in the last uh, six, in the last three years, we've done a lot of um, development of their role as well as <clears throat> their their tasks and functions within within the clinic. So, for example. Some, some of the things that we had to really consider when we started growing and understanding that the CHW played an integral role in all of this was everything from where will they sit? How many individuals do we need per site? How will we give them assignments? Will it be by site, by task, by the patient's level of care, by provider? There were all a number of ways in which we could try to organize ourselves because the reality was we did not have enough um, CHWs to be able to do this across the board throughout the organization. Um, in addition to that, there were elements of supervision and training that were really critical because if we're expecting these folks to be part of an integrated care team, um, there's a lot of work that needs to go on with that those individuals themselves as well as within the group. So now in, uh, in their role, we continued to support, be supported by the clinic. And in addition to what they were doing before out in the community, they have all of these responsibilities now. Um, it's much more sophisticated uh, a system that we have. You can see that the level of skill and training has been has been uh, has had to increase in order for uh, these individuals to be able to really um, deliver in a way that's beneficial for the entire for the entire treatment team, which includes the medical providers, the behavioral health providers, and so forth. Um, the the thing that that has worked for us is that from the very beginning, when we talked about doing integrated care, this was driven from the top down. In my role as part of the executive team, um, I, I was hands on in developing uh, the behavioral health team that was going to be um, the beginning of our, our full integration. Now, in the evolution of, of our organization, I'm now in the role of chief uh, behavioral health officer at the executive level, but I am hands-on supervising our CHWs. The reason for that because is because if we don't have that level of investment from the top on a day-to-day -day basis and the support and advocacy um, on my end for, for the, these folks, it, it doesn't work nearly as well. It's very, very tough to do integrated care. Everyone says, you know, that they have attained a certain level of integrated care, but there are different ways in which people define that. Um, true integration requires that you have to be able to create a team that is learns to work together despite their cultural and clinical differences, that they, the team can embrace and value honesty, uh, discipline, creativity, uh, humility, and they have to have these values and embrace them within the notion of a non-hierarchical team. Um, in order for everybody to be seen as equal with great respect for one another and be comfortable um, and be able to, to be vulnerable in, in, if, in that learning uh, environment for many of them. So, the development of, of such a team takes a lot of resources and time. You know, you're, we're talking about the need to develop specific skills, to be able to um, have the CHWs participate in clinical consult, in case reviews, uh, in educational uh, trainings. Um, and they've been able to, to really um, come through with all of that because of the, the kind of structure, infrastructure and support that we have in place that that lets everyone know they are an equal member of the team and what they do is one of the pieces that has to be there in order for our patients to truly receive the best level of care. And everyone in the organization understands that and you can see that by their interaction um, and how well they fit into the organization. They're not simply just the, you know, the CHWs that are um, doing something outside of the clinic and no one really knows what they're doing. That's how it used to be, but it's no longer that. I want to make sure I give Shara an opportunity to to speak up in, in terms of her own experience here, but I'll, I'll round this out with the, the kinds of things that now our um, uh, CHWs are able to do are all of these types of specific um, 
organize activities and tasks. And in order for them to be successful in their day to day, these all have to take place. And again, I emphasize the fact that you're going to be um, experiencing upfront costs. It's an investment because a lot of these services are not billable. But in preparation for that, we have our CHWs enter their progress notes into the same EMR as the team. We have them using um, dummy codes that we've created so that we can separate at the end of the year what their productivity has been by using these codes and thus also preparing ourselves for the day when these services hopefully will be reimbursed and they've already been trained in that, in that mindset. They now are going to be uh, participating in the treatment plan actively, meaning that they have to understand the, the patient's full treatment plan and how their contribution or the task um, or the support that they've given the patient, how does that fit into which goal and document it in such a way. So I'm really very proud of, of the work that the team has done. And I recognize that we've got more work uh, to do, but the one, uh, in lesson that that I, that I've learned or that we've learned is in order for this to truly work, you have to have commitment and investment and you have to be on the floor, you know, uh, from a anyone from the executive and management level on a regular basis in order for this to, to really stick. Shara, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, my name is Shara, and I am a community health worker at Western Wayne Family Health Care Centers. And just as Monica was saying, this is truly a full-on 100% commitment and networking between doctors and, um, well, our providers, I should say, and the patients and being that liaison for them. Um, as a community, we are looking to help make and encourage the cities that are our surrounding cities and residents to become healthier and mind, body, spirit, and choices that they make um, to all be incorporated into a patient's care plan. Um, this all comes with a price and the price of working hard, encouraging each other, building each other up, supporting and making healthier and wiser lifestyle changes is what I had put uh, that, that I had wrote down because it truly is a lifestyle change. And to be able to um, be that factor into the patient's lives, because sometimes things are not as easy as it may come. This is a, a um, continual learning experience for everyone all around, but we are here to create connections between populations and healthcare systems. And um, just as Monica was saying, right now we're not a billable service, but we are a recognized service. And that's like one of the most important things about that is to, you know, have us out here that we are seen and that we are being heard and that our practice is being validated. So um, I welcome the experience and I have been um, so um, honored and um, having a chance to be able to be that working connection between the patients, like I said, between the earlier, the, between the patients and the providers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll go ahead and pass it over to our next um, presenter. And we appreciate the time and opportunity to share this with you and, and we'll be available for questions at the end or if, you've, if any are coming in throughout the, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Shara and Monica. That was great. And I want to emphasize your points about investing the time and resources and in really integrating the CHWs and having that executive buy-in. So thank you again for the great work you're doing at the Western Maine Family Health Centers. Now I'd like to transition over to our last section and we'll be having Dr. Andrea Karakostas, Chief Executive Officer at the Asian American Health Coalition, or also known as Hope Clinic, and she'll be segueing into some of the work around the ES data collection and workforce. So, Andrea, can you speak up? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so wonderful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, just amazed at all the things that other health centers are doing. I want to echo what my colleagues uh, said about community health workers. We as well have um, and have utilized community health workers for a long time um, in collaboration with our partners. So you'll learn a little bit of our model um, as we go on. So uh, hello from uh, the country of Texas and um, a little bit about Hope Clinic. Um, okay, there we go. Too fast. Uh, 
so these are the two objectives, really understanding enabling services and data collection. Um, and this is our mission. Uh, something about Hope Clinic is that we uh, provide care in, in a very, um, in a, to a very multicultural community, and we serve, uh, um, we provide our patients with care in 25 different languages. If you don't, don't know, Texas has the third largest Asian American population in the country after New York and California. So we're a well-kept secret here. A few words about our clinic. Uh, the clinic was uh, named the Asian American Health Co started as the American Asian American Health Coalition in 1994 by four brave women who decided they were going to uh, um, produce in-language educational materials for the Asian American community who had little access to care. The clinic, um, soon they, they, they learned that if you educate people, then people won't actually access to care. So they established Hope Cl uh, a Clinic in 2002. In 2005, Stuart King Katrina hit Houston, and we received 15,000 evacuees from Louisiana. And the city was very ill-equipped to receive that number of Vietnamese-speaking uh, uh, people and they called on to Hope Clinic to assist with um, providing care to 15,000 evacuees, and that really brought uh, to the table the, the need for in-language care and um, resources for this large community. Today, Hope Clinic has uh, three locations. Uh, we serve about 22,000 lives uh, through 120,000 visits. This is our staff in 2009 in our first clinic, and I'm proud, proud to say that most of us are still um, here at the clinic, and this is our staff in 2020 and 2017. I have a more recent picture. And uh, <clears throat> this little graph shows, uh, shows you a little bit of the diversity of population. So when you have a population this diverse, uh, you're, sometimes the traditional community health worker program is much harder to house in one location. So which, while it's wonderful to have community health workers in the clinic, having this number of language diversity makes it very hard to reach to a community that way. The strategy that we use is we encourage and foster collaboration and help other organizations develop their own community health worker program. And we provide um, training, clinical support to all these community health workers so they can go into the communities and educate the community. And we have a consortium of about 16 different organizations that meet on a monthly basis. And in that consortium, we have um, some specific agreements, which, is, which are to make sure that all our education is done in one message, meaning that we're all going to provide the same message to the community, that we will not overlap on events. Uh, we will support each other and share resources. And so we coordinate uh, care and uh, around, we, we rally around different aspects of care, one of them being diabetes, of course, but we've also done breast cancer, cervical cancer, uh, census, and voter registration over the years. Um, this is a little graph that shows our growth over the last um, nine years. And I'll just kind of zoom through it because I know we have limited time and we want to talk about diabetes. So <clears throat> discovering diabetes in the Asian American community or in the multicultural community requires a specific set of skills, really understanding that your um, run-of-the-mill BMI may not be adequate enough to identify who is at risk for diabetes. So you see, um, for our uh, westernized standards, Asians for the most part look slim and trim. However, nearly 50% of men um, smoke and they um, their diet consists on large intake of carbs. So they, they the community usually develops pre-diabetes and diabetes at the lower BMA, uh, BMI uh, rate. So, so this is what we are taught to educate our patients on, the food plate. However, the reality for Asian families is that first of all, they eat on the bowl and the bowl for the most part. Second, that they share many dishes. And um, so we have had to adapt our educational model to the reality of our patients. Um, so some of other, other issues that we, and probably similar to Hispanic community, misconceptions that, you know, make sure that you eat until the last drop in your plate and that, you know, being a little chubby 
it's not necessarily bad, it's a sign of abundance. And um, uh, that being that if you're not overweight, according to the westernized standards, then you must be really healthy. However, you know, we have many, many, we have big issues with hypertension and diabetes. So uh, food, in, in a, when you work with very multicultural communities, especially new refugees and immigrants, you see that food is more than just a supp nutritional supplement that you put in your mouth. It is actually an identi identifier of cultures. You know, it brings communion, and it adds really a, a, a sense of belonging. So it's very hard to tell people what not to eat or what to eat when you are um, when you're trying to understand and foster community with within them. Um, so about we a health clinic we have about 1,400 diabetic patients, about five percent of our total patients, and about half of them are in some kind of medication, and 25 percent um, receive nutritional consultation. So how can I, where's my, okay. So how do we address the needs of our patients and how have we integrated um, our um, social, how do we use our social determinants of health uh, to understand the patient in, within that frame of work that I just presented to you? So first of all, uh, over the, the last, uh, I wanna say four years, we really have developed a, a fully, and again, everybody has a different um, idea of what fully integrated is, but a, a very integrated team care management for our patients. So we do have a behavioral health consultant, which is a licensed, um, um, con a licensed counselor that sits at the nursing station. And also our, our, uh, we have a registered dietitian who also sits at the nursing station. And when a patient is identified as, um, for example, we have a diabetic patient, who hasn't been able to change their A1C outcome in the last year or last six months. And at that point, we can certainly pull in the, the behavioral health consultant to see what are the, the barriers in, in behavior change that need to be addressed so that the patient can move from a contemplative state to an action, to, to defining his self-management goals. Um, we, the integration with the social determinants happens when the behavioral health consultant can integrate the environment in which the, the patient is, lives in, uh, plays in, works in, and understand how that impacts their um, treatment or, or A1C. So here we have um, around the patient, we have the PCP who certainly provides the clinical care. We have the dietitian who can address uh, in a very cultural sensitive way, the, the needs of the patient. And we have the behavioral health consultant that can um, address anxieties about treatment, anxiety, uh, understanding about the consequences of following a diet. And uh, the, our outreach and, um, behavior and community health worker through the social determinants of health working with our community partners is able to address the environment in which the patient um, surrounds, herself, surrounds themselves. And we have worked a lot with identifying big pockets of where our patients come from, and then working with the community organization in, in making sure that we, for example, conduct walkability studies in their neighborhoods to understand why, if we're telling a patient you need to walk 30 minutes a day, that we understand that the patient lives in this neighborhood where there's no sidewalk. Where um, so really addressing their environment, working with the community to create more walkable spaces, uh, more green spaces, so that we can address the upstream needs of the diet of, the, of our patients. So what it does it what does our coordinated diabetes care look like? Again, we have the behavioral health consultant and the dietitian who uh, we use a very a warm off um, warm hand off. Um, to, from the provider to them, and uh, as I told you, we can address the um, the care model and their objectives and goals. And in addition, work with our um, care coordination team to then further address their barriers to accessing. Okay. Um, 
Other additional services like you do, we provide, of course, the 340B wraparound medication uh, assistance, um, and we really do utilize our A1C screening to the maximum. So we screen pretty much if you walk into the clinic, you will get screened for hepatitis C, hepatitis C, and A1C. Um, so watch out. Uh, so we do have a patient registry that allows for us to recall and track the patients, and it's also a registry that's managed by the behavioral health consultant as well as the dietitian. Um, and uh, really, what is it? What's the value in having um, enabling services? What is the the value of having our care coordination, our um, behavioral health consultant, and really, really reach a, a try to demystify diabetes? Um, cost savings, you know, the healthier your patients, the, the lower utilization you have, and uh, um, they'll shorter the visits, greater compliance, and um, I cannot stress enough how important it has, for us, has been for us to really understand the environment in which the patients live and what are the social um, surrounding uh, Im impact that surrounds them when addressing their 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 health care concerns, not just diabetes, and working with the community to figuring out what are long-term um, solutions that we can provide to the community beyond the the one-on-one -on -one patient care. <clears throat> um, here's a little diagram that shows uh, how understanding disease burden across cultures is critical to achieving outcomes and uh, establishing you know, really clear clinical protocols um, that allow us to continuously screen patients and be able to measure um, our outcomes. And of course, uh, defining the long-term sustainability of the program. Um, so these are the stakeholders that participate in our program, the community, community members. We work a lot with the city and the and the um, and the state in um, making sure that we are um, collecting information, measuring data, um, and national coalitions learning from best practices, um, implementing the social determinants uh, of health screening methodology was a big step for us. Really um, helped us understand where our patients are coming from and what the reality is, and open our eyes to to the fact that we need to do much more uh, for the community than it, is, than it is within our walls, not just from the instinctive part of working with the community and, be, and being and doing outreach, but actually is strategizing about longer term solutions. So really moving from the instinct of, of a good um, nonprofit to strategic um, alliances with people that you wouldn't have worked on before just to be able to address the the specific needs of the community, and of course, working with other organizations and other FQHCs. And so what does um, the future hold for us? Really, I think that there needs to be the even more enhanced awareness about um, diversity and diabetes, looking for upstream solutions beyond our clinic walls. Um, um, certainly, community, community health workers are a big step into the community, a big door but yet working with other non-traditional partners as well. Uh, increasing screening for pre-diabetes. I think diabetes management, of course, is very important, but it's already a disease. Uh, addressing pre-diabetes, um, working with behavioral modifications for pre-diabetes patients is, is very important. And increasing the team-based care, um, utilizing uh, uh, nutritional services and the behavioral health services that can actually you know, help the patient create a better um, goal, goal setting. Um, we have used the group visit model for a while, very unsuccessfully. Um, and the reason probably because a lot of our patients um, work more than two jobs and um, taking time on a regular basis to be on a two hour uh, doctor's uh, visit it was um, something that they couldn't commit to. So our group visit um, project was not uh, successful. And uh, currently, we are in the process of developing a program that's going to be called A Bite of Hope. And you will hear more about it hopefully in the future. And it's a food as prescription model. 
Um, I'm sure that other people have used it, and um, we are experimenting with it just now. Last but not least, um, I hope you're hungry. And if you're not hungry, I guess I haven't done a good job yet because I tried to put the yummiest foods I could find on the internet on my presentation. So I think um, that is that is all for me. Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Karakostas, for sharing Hope Clinic's strategies and models. Um, I think you really stated well the importance of the social and cultural determinants of health. And I loved how you said the diversity of diabetes and understanding that um, from the health and perspective, um, because food is really identity. And so look forward to hearing more in the future. And we now want to wrap up the presenters with Alex and Dr. Kiriglian from the National LGBT Health Education Center, also known as the Fenway Institute, and he serves as the Director of Education and Training Programs. And so we'll kick off with him before going into Q&A. Dr. Kiriglian, are you on? Hi, everybody. Yes, I am. Nice to join you all today, and we're going to talk about how to use uh, enabling services and how to prepare community health workers to create inclusive affirming care environments for LGBTQ people and how to use uh, data to enhance quality of care and engage in quality improvement with this population. Albert, am I able to advance the slides or? Uh, yes, you should. Let me just double check that. It looks like someone yeah, else should. still has control. Let me double check that. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay, can you try that one more time? If any case, I'll, I'll transition the slides until we get that figured out. Okay. Okay, great. You can move to the next one. Next slide. Thank you. There are a lot of terms that get used when we start focusing on care for sexual and gender minority patients that can be overwhelming and confusing. So let's walk through those together slowly to make sure we're all on the same page. Next slide. The first big point to make is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. These are two different experiences that people have, two different concepts. Each of us has both a sexual orientation and a gender identity. So everybody on this webinar has one of each. The terms people use to identify in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity have evolved throughout history. So the language we use now is different than what we used 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, even a year or two ago. I have new terms I'm hearing from particularly my younger patients that I hadn't heard even a couple of years ago. The terminology a given person uses to self-identify may also evolve throughout their life. You can understand that someone may initially identify as a woman and later identify as a man, for example. There are, of course, also going to be cultural differences in terms of language people use and concepts related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Next slide, please. What is gender identity? This is a person's inner sense of being a girl, woman, boy, man, something else in terms of gender or having no gender at all. When babies are born in most countries and cultures around the world, they're assigned one of two sexes based on external anatomy, female or male, in some cases intersex. We now know that these babies grow up, become children, adolescents, and adults who may have a gender identity and inner sense of their gender that doesn't align in a traditional way with the sex they were assigned when they were born. We also appreciate that many people have a gender identity that's neither girl nor boy, neither woman nor man. So we appreciate that people have non-binary gender identities outside the two traditional options. Gender expression is how a person communicates or presents their gender identity to the outside world. That can be through mannerisms, voice, the way someone walks, their hairstyle, the way they dress. And this also exists along a continuum. It's not necessarily the case that people assigned female sex at birth want to or ought to express their gender in a traditionally feminine way. And it's not necessarily the case that people assigned uh, male sex at birth want to or ought to express their gender in a traditionally masculine way. So we talk increasingly about a gender continuum in that sense. Looks like this skipped ahead a few slides. If we could go back. Go back one more, great, thank you. 
So Albert, are you still you're still controlling them? Uh, I, uh, yes, but I think you or Kay has privileges now, so he can try it okay. one more time. Okay. There you go. Right. All right, there we go. Thanks. What does the term transgender mean? This is an umbrella term referring to uh, folks whose gender identity does not align in a traditional way with the sex they were assigned when they were born. People assigned male sex at birth who identify as women may prefer themselves as transgender women, trans women, simply as a woman, and say, I was a girl when I was a kid, I'm a woman as an adult, I'm no different than any cisgender or non-transgender woman, so I don't identify as transgender, we hear that sometimes too. And people assigned female sex at birth who identify as a man may refer themselves as a transgender man, trans man, simply as a man. We see terms in the research literature like male to female or female to male. We try to stay away from these terms because they emphasize the sex assigned at birth rather than just the current affirmed gender identity. People with non-binary gender identities may have a variety of ways to identify the most common terms I hear from uh, my non-binary um, fr uh, friends and uh, patients are terms like gender queer or gender fluid. Gender fluid implies a gender identity that will uh, potentially evolve dynamically over time. And we use terms like trans masculine and trans feminine that are more inclusive people with non-binary gender identities. Sexual orientation, in contrast to gender identity, is how a person identifies their physical, emotional, and romantic attractions to other people. This includes three components. Desire, this is whom someone is attracted to. Behavior, this includes uh, whom someone is or isn't engaging in sexual activity with and what kind of sexual activity. So we use concrete operationalized behavioral terms like men who have sex with men, men who have sex with men and women, women who have sex with women, women who have sex with women and men, and so on. And see this language is still quite binary. It hasn't caught up with our more non-binary concepts of gender identity. And the third component of sexual orientation is identity. This refers to the range of labels and communities that exist in society that refer to a person's uh, sexual orientation and that someone may or may not identify with. So terms like straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, and so on. The point is one of self-identification. We can't tell what someone's sexual orientation is even based on their behavior. There are, for example, many men who have sex with men who don't identify as gay, don't identify as bisexual, or as queer, identify as straight. So we have to let people tell us what their identity is in terms of sexual orientation or gender, and then we have to document that in terms of data collection in healthcare. Next, well, here we go. I can do it myself. So why is it important to collect SOGI data in healthcare? The Institute of Medicine, Healthy People 2020, convened national experts, reviewed the existing literature and concluded that there really are unique health disparities experienced by LGBTQ people, and that it's critical in order to provide affirming care for us to collect sex orientation and gender identity or SOGI data on all our patients, not just LGBTQ patients, and then provide tailored patient-centered care using these data. Important to understand disparities experienced by this population. We use a minority stress framework, sexual minority stress and gender minority stress. The idea is that LGBTQ people from early childhood to older adulthood experience everyday discrimination, victimization, microaggressions, we refer to this as external stigma related stress. Over time can lead for many people to disruptions in general psychological processes like uh, emotional regulation, interpersonal functioning, coping skills, beliefs that aren't adaptive, like believing it's never gonna get better, nobody can be trusted, no one will ever love me. All this external stress can lead to internal stress, like internalized homophobia or transphobia, expecting rejection and identity concealment. All of this over time can lead to what we see in the research, which is a higher prevalence of depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, decreased self-care, decreased engagement in primary care, and down the road, a higher prevalence of various physical health problems, like the higher prevalence of diabetes among certain LGBTQ subpopulations. So it's important to end invisibility of LGBTQ people in healthcare. That means having a system where frontline staff, community health workers, registration intake, for example, ask all people for their sexual orientation and their gender identity coming into our health centers, and then for us to tailor the healthcare we provide accordingly. Clinicians aren't great at asking these questions. We tend to overlook it and skip these questions and then miss important uh, health-related information when we're providing care. This is an example of why it matters. A real G-identified patient, 40-year-old trans man, who came in with pelvic pain and spotting, 
biopsy determined that Rodrigo had cervical cancer because his health center wasn't collecting gender identity data in a sensitive, effective way. No one told Rodrigo that he needed routine cervical pap tests. He didn't, didn't, he never disclosed his transgender status. And this cervical cancer was unfortunately not caught until it was much later in the process of uh, progressing. It's important to note that patients aren't offended by being asked for their sexual orientation or gender identity. Here are two studies that show that. Many clinicians are afraid of offending patients by asking these questions. Patients themselves are not offended. We also have this study of uh, demographic forms, two different demographic forms distributed to patients. One included SOGI questions, the other did not. Patients were no more likely to be offended by the SOGI questions. And uh, the percentage of patients offended overall was just 3%. So it's a lot of anticipatory anxiety among our staff we're afraid of offending patients, and we project that onto them because we're not trained to ask these questions in a sensitive, effective way. And the patients themselves aren't offended. Some staff may need extra coaching and reassurance. And uh, we need to make it clear to staff that we're not trying to change their values, political beliefs, religions. We're really trying to provide the best possible inclusive care for all patients who walk through our doors. And an important part of that, the research shows us, is to know the sexual orientation and gender identity of our patients. Regular check-ins with staff and community health workers will also show us what challenges they're encountering what forms need to be revised, for example, when they actually try this stuff out with patients, and then we can iteratively improve the quality of our uh, processes and flows accordingly. This is one tool on our website, lgbthealtheducation.org, called Ready, Set, Go. These are guidelines for collecting SOGI data in terms of non-clinical staff, clinical staff, and how you set up the system overall, so I encourage you all to check it out. We have SOGI demonstration videos on our website, two to three minute bite-sized videos showing how to ask these questions in terms of frontline staff, at the front desk, at registration, and in the clinician's office. So you can check these out. These are at lgbthealtheducation.org as well. These are very practical uh, instructions for how to ask these questions in English and in Spanish on our website. And these are pamphlets you can hand patients for them to understand that we're asking all patients these questions, that we're doing it to provide affirming care for everyone, that we're going to keep the information confidential, and we're only going to use it in a respectful way that's directly relevant to their healthcare. We have these on our website translated into Spanish and simplified Chinese, and we just translated them into Arabic, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese as well. Those will be on the website soon. So you can ask these questions through the patient portal if your electronic health record allows that. Uh, it allows privacy and comfort of doing this in one's own home. Of course, if a patient has questions about why their information is being requested, there's probably no one at home to answer. You can ask it at uh, registration, at intake, you need to set up with privacy. We use electronic tablets at Fenway, but we've seen it done with uh, paper forms where it gets manually inputted afterwards. You, of course, want frontline staff who are trained to ask any questions that patients may have about why this information is being requested. But it does normalize the questions along with other demographic questions about race, ethnicity, languages, spoken, income, and so on. As we mentioned, clinicians aren't great at asking these questions, so relying on the providers doesn't tend to work well. We have found that practice transformation initiatives were part of the best way to do this ask the questions of registration. This is how we ask about sexual orientation along with other demographic questions. We find patients are much more uh, reserved about providing their income than they are their sexual orientation, it turns out. And this is how we ask about gender identity. You want to ask current gender identity, sex assigned at birth as well. If you don't ask about sex assigned at birth, a lot of gender diverse people will check male or female, and the system won't pick up on the fact that this is gender diverse persons, so you need both. You want to ask what name the person uses, what names on their insurance records, because those two may be different, and then what are your pronouns? Pronouns are critical for providing affirming care for trans and gender diverse clients. So we want to ask all patients, what are your pronouns? We used to ask what pronouns you prefer, but preference implies it's optional and other people can ignore it. So we ask, what are your pronouns? Some people's pronouns are he, him, his. Some people's pronouns are she, her, hers. Some people's pronouns non-binary, are they, them, theirs. There are other pronouns people are using that were developed specifically for non-binary folks. So Z here, here's, for example. You'd say Z is in the waiting room. The doctor is ready to see here. That chart is here's. It takes practice uh, to correctly employ 
these non-binary pronouns, you'll make mistakes initially, that's fine. You want to apologize, say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, and move on and show that you're using correct pronouns. Gender identity you know, may come up as early as three years old when gender identity is consolidated. A parent may come raising questions about their child's gender expression, for example. It's okay to ask in a pediatric practice. Some kids feel like a girl, some kids feel like a boy, some kids feel like something else. What do you feel like? There's no right or wrong answer. And sexual orientation, we start asking as a best, best practice around 13 when we start talking about sexual health. Important to note, parents are filling out these forms, they're gonna have bias. So you wanna have some set aside time just with minors in your practice to ask them directly. If a patient becomes upset, don't be, you know, uh, don't personalize it, just apologize and move on. That can be a way to reestablish a constructive dialogue. It's also voluntary provision of information. No patient is required to provide this information. We're required to ask it, but if they choose not to disclose, we just document that. You also wanna be careful about language that makes assumptions about your patient's gender identity. Like instead of saying, how may I help you, sir? You can just say, how may I help you? Because you don't know if someone's sir or ma'am, how they tell you how they identify. We wanna avoid some terms that we know are disrespectful or outdated like homosexual, instead we wanna use the language the patient themselves uses. We don't wanna say transvestite or transgendered ED. We say transgender without ED and we always use it as an adjective, never as a noun. So we say transgender person or person of transgender experience. Instead of sexual preference or lifestyle choice, we refer to sexual orientation. You don't, if you're unsure about a patient's name or pronouns, you just say, I'd like to be respectful. What are your name and pronouns? And you could also say, could your charter insurance be under a different name if the name they give you doesn't match their records? That's fine. That's, uh, you're actually being helpful if you do that. You also wanna review your forms to make sure that these are using inclusive language. This is a brief on our website you can download specifically on how to revise your forms and policies. You can have diagrams that are gender neutral so that uh, they're not exclusionary. For example, in an OBGYN practice, you just have diagrams and forms that are uh, for cisgender women, you're going to be exclusionary towards transmasculine people who may need OBGYN services. And you want to, you know, add these variables into your clinical decision support and quality improvement initiatives. Uh, so you want to systematically collect sexual orientation, gender identity, sex assigned at birth, and have anatomical inventories. So if, you know, you just identify a patient as male and 52 years old, you're gonna have uh, clinical decision supports that indicates they're due for these various measures, including diabetes measures. But if you're also identifying that this person was assigned female sex at birth, there are all kinds of other hair uh, activities you need to engage in. For example, you wanna have an anatomical inventory that's tracking body modifications. And this patient who has male sex may also have a cervix, a vagina, uterus, ovaries, breasts, but you wanna ask them how they refer to their anatomy and use that language back, like do they refer to a front hole instead of a vagina or chest instead of breasts. They may be due for a cervical pap smear, mammogram, and so on. You can also stratify your UDS measures and do clinical decision, uh, sorry, you can do population health management and see how you're doing, for example, on diabetes screening among your transgender and gender diverse patients versus the general population to see if there are disparities you need to address in a population specific, culturally tailored way. And this is an example of an anatomical inventory we have at Fenway. With that, I'm gonna um, turn it over to uh, the organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peruglian. Uh, so that was a jam-packed uh, lineup of presenters and wanna thank everyone for their presentations and um, talk about importance of enabling services and CHWs. And now I just wanna give the last um, few minutes with our, um, oh, actually quick plug. So in relation to Dr. Karakostis' presentation, um, there is a data collection toolkit for enabling services available on Apple's website. So please check it out here. Um, and it has EHR integration um, so in relation to um, SOGI data, you know, these go hand in hand in terms of really collecting population health data for your health centers. Um, without further ado, we do have uh, Tracy Branch, who is the Senior Advisor and of the Strategic Partnerships and Office of Quality Improvement at the Bureau of Primary Healthcare under the Health Resources and Service Administration. I uh, just want to give her a few minutes to make some closing remarks to close out this session. Uh, Tracy, are you on?
I am, Albert. I appreciate that. Um, thank you all for joining today's webinar. Greatly appreciate your participation. I'd also like to thank today's hosts, um, APCHO, Migrant Clinicians Network, MHP Salud, and the Fenway Institute for their leadership in facilitating this webinar series. Each session within the series effectively addressed a different aspect of diabetes quality improvement. And if you were unable to attend any of the earlier sessions, I encourage you to view the archived webinars on APCHO's website. Today's presenters did a fantastic job at um, offering strategies to overcome the social, cultural, and health literacy barriers experienced by patients, utilizing the integration of community health workers into um, healthcare systems. We at HRSA strive to maintain timeliness in our activities related to diabetes quality improvement. For me, to better understand the needs of um, health centers patients as well as the providers, I like to ask questions. So to that end, I'm going to provide several polling questions that I would appreciate your response to. So if you'd like to pull the first of the polling questions up. Um, so what we're looking at here is um, just to get some ideas to does your health center currently employ community health workers? And if you can use your polling function to answer yes, no, or unsure, that would be helpful. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to go ahead and um, respond to that. And it looks like on my end, I can't see the responses, so you'll have to give me an idea. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so I'll be able to tell when people are pretty much done. Okay, so we can go ahead perfect. and close that one. Perfect. Um, so let's go ahead and open our second polling question. And with this one, we're looking to find out, do you see value in employing community health workers, even if you're not reimbursed for their services? And I know um, one of our presenters spoke about just that, um, that issue. So again, I'll give you a few moments to respond to that. Thanks. Okay, and we can go ahead and close that one. And then for our last question, um, I'll read this one to you um, because it's an open ended question. So I'd like for you to enter your comments into the questions box. Um, and then we can look at some of those and read a few of those out of time allow. So what do you see as the drawbacks of integrating community health workers into a multidisciplinary care team. So again, just thinking about your respective practices, um, what are some of the challenges? You know, if you're effectively doing it, um, if there are some additional barriers, if you're not effectively doing it, why, why not? And I'll give a few moments for individuals to, to type out responses. Thanks, Tracy. So while we wait for some responses to trickle in, um, just wanted to emphasize your point about um, the recordings that have been posted and posted on the diabetes.apsha.org if you missed the first three. And then the fourth one today will be posted by tomorrow in case you want to share it with your staff and um, colleagues. So I'm gonna see if we have any answers here. Okay. Uh, we do. So let's see. So in relation to the question again is, what do you see as drawbacks for integrating CHWs into multidisciplinary care teams? Um, here we have one saying a lack of administration buy-in. Okay. More, more education and preparedness for CHWs. Sometimes not everyone is on board or actively involved. Another one is we do not use CHWs currently, but I'm interested in finding them. I would think the primary care barrier would be communication. 
and I'll read one more. We have plenty. Um, we can share this <laughs> offline too with everyone um, and with you, Tracy. Um, this one is, I think the drawbacks will be the fact that CHWs are not credentialed. However, mm -hmm. the education about the roles and responsibilities of CHWs as part of the practice integration are crucial. And then it looks like there are a few that also made it into the chat box. So just wanted to oh, wow. make you aware of that. Great. Um, yes, there's plenty of information here that we would love to harvest and harness for everyone. And so what we can do is pull together maybe a one pager or kind of an FAQ so that we can offer it in addition to the recording and slides, if that works. Perfect. Great. Tracy, anything else you'd like to say? No, I just, again, greatly appreciate your allowing me to participate. And um, again, I thank everyone for their participation in the webinar, as well as the polling questions. The information that you're providing is extremely helpful for us. Thank you so much uh, again to you all at HRSA for providing again the framework and the resources to continue our efforts at the you know NCA level, the PCA, HCCN, and health center level. Um, we do have pretty much no minutes to spare. Um, so again, want to thank everyone and our speakers for today's wonderful presentation, and for everyone for lending your time to attend today's session. Uh, we'd like to let our audience know that the slide deck and recordings for the first three webinars, again, are available. And we want to make sure that you can take a few minutes to um, check out our diabetes.afsha.org um, and also take a few minutes once you exit to do the evaluation to let us know how we can um, create more awareness around diabetes prevention and treatment uh, for next year. And if there are no questions, we will end this session um, soon. Thank you so much, everyone.